challenging name. It's uh, obviously a foreign name. Uh, we're a Swiss company, a uh, Swiss cybersecurity company. It came out of a company called uh, Nagra, Nagra. Uh, they've been around since the 1950s, but we're their wholly owned subsidiary that does cybersecurity. So we do have a, a challenging name to pronounce here in the States, but it, uh, you say it enough times and it starts rolling off the tongue. So. Uh, Cool. Thank you guys very much for coming out. I hope you guys are enjoying the, con uh, the conference so far. Hope lunch was good. I'll probably skip the cliche about being in the time slot immediately after lunch and just hope that no one falls asleep during the presentation, but that's, that's just fine. Uh, before I get going, I always like to do a quick poll just so that I can understand who it is that I'm speaking to. So just show of hands here, how many of you guys would say that you are blockchain people, cryptocurrency people? Maybe you know a lot about cryptocurrency, maybe you're heavily invested in some sort of cryptocurrency. Cool. One or two? Awesome. How many of you guys would say that you're either uh, apprehensive about the technology, maybe you don't know enough to know one way or another, uh, you're, just, you're not quite a blockchain person because maybe you haven't learned about it yet? Show of hands. Haven't been fully exposed to technology. Okay, now the third option. How many of you guys are sick and tired of hearing about blockchain and plan to harass me with challenging questions and insults about my mother afterwards? Anybody? Well, I saw one hand, so I'll look out for you. That's okay. Well, you know, what a beautiful audience then. Thank you guys very much uh, for coming out. I am uh, Mike Anton. I'm a senior product manager of blockchain at Kudelski Security. I will tell you a little bit more about what that entails here in a minute, but for those of you who have seen blockchain talks before, I think that you guys probably have similar, uh, come out from back, back behind here, I'm short enough as it is, I don't need that working against me. I think if you guys have seen a blockchain talk before, then you've probably seen a lot of the, the grandiose arm waving, the blockchain is the future of everything, and I try to take a slightly different approach. Not that there's anything wrong with being a futurist in any way, shape, or form, but I also believe in pragmatism. And uh, so, for example, I like to start with a riddle. What do Chick-fil-A, Game of Thrones, and Atlanta traffic have in common? Anybody? All three include problems that will not be solved with blockchain. No matter how hard you try to stick Game of Thrones on the blockchain, there will be no Season 9. No matter how badly you want to stick every car on the Atlanta freeway at rush hour on the blockchain, you're still going to be sitting there in traffic. And no matter how hard you try to blockchain Chick-fil-A, they still will not be open on Sundays. So I'm sorry for that. If you guys were looking for those sort of solutions, then I, I apologize for the letdown, but I'll let you know right off the bat that that's not what I'm about. Um, I will show you, though, a quote that is very near and dear to my heart, and we'll discuss this a little bit more as we go, but certainly something to live by, maybe build a career off of, who knows? So really, really absorb this one. So I'm Michael Anton. I am a senior product manager of blockchain within our research and development organization at Kudelski Security. I started my career in consulting with a, uh, a small to mid-sized consultancy called Protivity. I got to travel around the country solving really hard data problems for banks. So that was fun and terrifying simultaneously. If you guys ever worked in financial services and ever saw the data that, that is there, you'd probably be terrified too. Uh, I went over to First Data. I just hadn't gotten enough of the financial services life. So I went over to First Data where I worked in uh, e-commerce fraud prevention. So we worked on taking a product to market that would evaluate 100 to 200 different characteristics of a credit card transaction in real time, run it through a machine learning algorithm, and then score it on a scale of 0 to 1,000 how likely we thought it was to be fraud. We could return that score to a merchant, and they could make the educated decision for themselves whether or not they wanted to accept uh, the transaction right there at, at the point of sale. So Pretty cool product for sure, but I was uh, extremely excited to make the switch over to Kudelski Security. Like I said right at the beginning of the talk, we're a, a small Swiss cybersecurity company coming from a larger parent uh, company that's been around since the 1950s. We do things like uh, root of trust, IoT security. We're you know we've got a whole uh, core of cryptographers and brilliant people. So a little bit about my job. These are our brilliant people, and I like to consider myself the professional dumbest guy in the room. It's a, it's a pretty cool job to be. I don't know if you guys have ever worked with product managers before, but these are our geniuses. These are our stallions, as they would have said in the show Silicon Valley. 
These guys have some amazing ideas. A lot of them are technologists, scientists, cryptographers. We've got physicists on staff. And so as they have crazy ideas for new technologies, what I try to do is I go out and I vet out these technologies and I try to build and run a business around the technology. So I say that not to make this a product management speech in any way, shape, or form, but I feel like this gives a little bit of background about who I am and kind of the angle that I'm coming uh, from when I present this talk to you guys. So have you guys ever worked with a product manager before? Yeah, a handful of you. Cool. Some people, not, not so many. I know a lot of the folks that I've worked with in my company had never really worked with product managers before. A lot of people think it's project manager. A lot of people think it's product owner. And I will say that a product manager tends to span both of those activities as well. But I think that this pyramid right here kind of represents my job in a nutshell. And this will be the end of my arm waving about product management. But what we like to do is separate things between the problem space and the solution space. There are problems out there in this world, and we want to understand what they are without starting to think through solutions. If you guys are engineers, if you've ever been through any sort of problem-solving class or problem-solving process, this is probably familiar to you. And then we've got our geniuses that solve problems professionally that live in the solution space. They tend not to talk very well together. And so what a product manager does is owns this entire pyramid and strives for this golden sliver in the middle that I like to call product market fit. And this is how well can we tailor a solution to actually fit the needs of a problem. I'm sure you guys have seen some amazing technology, some amazing problems out there or products out there before that look really cool, look really sleek, but what problem do they actually solve, right? That's probably the work of someone starting in the solution space and not really involving a product manager, not, not really working to the point where they understand who the client is and what they need. So that's enough about me. I'm certainly happy to talk afterwards. I'm a very passionate product manager, so if you guys ever have any questions, certainly feel free to, uh, to pull me aside. Over the next 40 minutes or so, I will give you guys a quick blockchain primer for those of you who haven't been terribly exposed to the technology. I will talk through blockchain and the enterprise, and then I'll kind of give you a couple uh, looks into the not-so-distant future for the technology so that you can kind of understand where it's going. The overall point of this presentation, though, is to convince you of a couple things. One, blockchain will not solve all of your problems, but there are some things that it does very well. Blockchain has the ability to help industries and enterprises uh, disrupt their current processes and move into completely new and uncharted waters. I really do believe that, especially in instances where you've got multiple parties exchanging value in a, a low to medium trust setting. And then finally, whether or not you guys like it, whether or not crypto wins or crypto loses or is up or down or where the markets go, understand that it is coming. It is starting to creep into enterprises now. Demand is picking up. And so you guys as security practitioners need to be prepared to understand the technology and some of the threats and challenges associated with the implementation of it. Cool. So what is blockchain? Uh, first, let's talk through Bitcoin versus blockchain because that's, that's a, a really good starting place, I feel. A, a lot of people tend to say, oh, blockchain is that fake internet money thing, right? It's, it's that thing that they, uh, they invented and it's fake internet money and drugs and terrorists. That's, that's typically what I hear from someone who isn't terribly familiar with the terms. They tend to, uh, to merge the topics in their minds. So let's, let's get it straight. Let's try and understand what they are and separate the topics. Bitcoin is fake internet money that was invented by Satoshi Nakamoto, this mysterious individual or group with a really cool white paper called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system released in 2008. They still don't know who Satoshi is, uh, so there's a lot of mystery around this. But basically, Bitcoin is a network of people and a, a network of nodes that can exchange value uh, from peer to peer to peer in a, in a uh, low trust environment where they can still have faith in the transactions as they're taking place. So you'll see here, and I don't want to get too, too deep into the details of exactly how the blocks are built, but it's a, an awesome combination of understanding tokens and stringing them together with, uh, with hashing. Now blocks contain all the new transaction data and it, each block contains an encoded hash of the previous block before it. So that's how you end up getting this chain concept of how they're all strung together. So what is, sorry, I'm using a mouse here to try and drive the slides. So what is blockchain? 
strip out the fake internet money. Blockchain is really just a data store that is built on top of historical data. It's got a good description here for it. It is a ledger that is distributed, decentralized, and irreversible. Let's talk through what that means. First of all, it's a ledger. It's a data store. You've got data stores in all of your enterprises, all, all, all of your uh, IT ecosystems today. If you don't need a data store, you probably don't need a blockchain. Let's start there. It is a data store then that is distributed. So we've got a bunch of different peers running on some sort of peer-to-peer -peer network. And this distributed network allows people to exchange money or tokens or anything of digital value in a decentralized manner. What that means is that they don't have to rely on trust provided by some sort of uh, third-party intermediary who's going to give a transaction credibility. So what does that mean? If I were to pay you, for example, say I were to Venmo you $15 because you picked up the, the tab for pizza the other night or something like that, how do you know that my money is actually good? How does it actually make it over to you? Well, present day, I have to rely on a third-party intermediary who's going to handle <clears throat> the entire transaction from the time that it leaves my account all the, all the way to the time that it enters your account. And that provides a decent amount of trust. What this allows is a framework to pull that intermediary out, so it's, it's a decentralized way of exchanging that value. Finally, because of the way the blocks are built on top of each other, because each one contains a hash of the entire previous chain, it makes it irreversible. So the blockchain or a blockchain is always moving forward. Uh, there's no way uh, within mathematical reason to go back and change or taint historical data on a blockchain. Those are kind of the basics. It's also important to realize that there are numerous variants of different types of blockchains out there. Um, I want to give you a little bit of a sense about what consensus is. So you guys might hear the word consensus. This is something that's thrown around quite a bit and it's actually kind of a, a controversial topic in the blockchain world and also for people who maybe are not as familiar with the blockchain world but certainly want to poo-poo it pretty quickly. It's this concept of proof of work and proof of stake and some of the other consensus mechanisms. So we've got ourselves distributing digital value in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Everyone's got a copy of the ledger. Someone goes ahead and transacts. Who decides who gets to copy or who gets to update the latest copy of the ledger, right? Who retains the master copy of that ledger? Well, this is a really, really important problem because those who have that ability to update the copy have the ability to potentially taint the, the data within it. And so we've got this whole emerging field of crypto economics that's come out where people are trying to understand how to incentivize people to take certain very specific uh, honest actions without jacking up transaction costs too much, without having to insert a, a, a complete intermediary. So that's what these consensus mechanisms are. We've got proof of work. This is the, the really well-known one. This is probably the most controversial one out there. This is the concept of solving a really hard puzzle. So how do I know that I get to add a block to the chain? Well, I get to solve the puzzle, and I solve the puzzle first. This is what Bitcoin uses. This is currently what Ethereum uses, although they're switching over to proof of stake slowly and, and potentially in different chunks. Um, but this is controversial because of its high energy consumption. So I don't know if you guys have uh, heard this before. This was from digiconomist.net actually this week. They constantly update this number. But every single transaction that happens on the Bitcoin network takes so much electricity to mine that you could power 14.7 US households for a day just to solve the puzzle that you need to to add it to the block. That's crazy. That is a crazy amount of energy consumption. And so while there are some amazing things that you can do when you have consensus in a peer-to-peer -peer mechanism, this is obviously still a problem associated with a young, immature technology that needs to be solved because the future of payments cannot require 15 households worth of electricity for every single transaction. We've got proof of stake, so instead of mining, we're now forging. Proof of stake basically says that we're going to allocate you your opportunity to add a new block to the chain based off of the percentage of the monetary base that you hold. Uh, with the idea being that if you held so much cryptocurrency uh, in a specific blockchain or whatever it was, you would not be incentivized to do anything that could undermine the value of the legitimacy of the cryptocurrency or its operations for fear of devaluing your own asset. So it's kind of an interesting concept. It's still definitely unproven and it's, it's definitely controversial as well. There are many, many other consensus mechanisms out there 
Uh, there's proof of, proof of authority, proof of importance. Those kind of look like proof of stake with some extra business logic added in to try and make someone uh, authoritative or uh, important. But I'd say that those are kind of the basics about consensus mechanisms that one should know. Hey, my, would you mind to, I've, proof of authority has come up a couple times that I've seen, but mm -hmm. I never understood it. Would you mind to just explain a little more? Yeah, so uh, there are a couple different algorithms about proof of authority that are out there. Um, either way, though, it's basically just evaluating someone's characteristics. Um, what can make them important? So it, it would be anything associated with uh, the time that they've held their money to the, uh, the amount of money that they own, like the, the proof of stake. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, there are different structures of these peer-to-peer -peer networks that can allocate maybe different, uh, different roles and responsibilities. So you might have certain different types of nodes that might play different pieces. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm far from an expert on the proof of, uh, of authority consensus mechanisms. But what I can tell you is that there are a variety of them out there, and they're all kind of derivatives of proof of stake. But like, they, okay, because as I say, the proof of work is more of like, you know, I got all these people doing work, and then when one gets the right answer, like, you know, we reward them. Mm -hmm. it's, they were incentivized to do the work because they get a little reward when they do it. But proof of stake and proof of authority and the ones like that are more like, you know, trusting, trusting the the person is showing characteristics that they're not incentivized to do something bad for the right. system. Yep. That's the general. Yeah, idea. exactly. And I mean, you can have round robins and all sorts of stuff where maybe where everyone is going to take a turn. There's all sorts of different ways to do the consensus mechanisms, and so they can be granted their authority that way. Uh, like I said, they're unproven, and so they're pretty controversial in the world of crypto economists, which I am not one of. Uh, but I certainly understand when you're implementing something new like this that has the ability to enable someone to potentially undermine the integrity or the legi uh, of a monetary base or the legitimacy of their transactions, I certainly do understand why, for example, you would maybe want to roll it out in a, a smaller, you know, limited run basis. Uh, so that's been pretty pretty hot topic right now, especially in the Ethereum space, as they're working on making their shift over from proof of uh, work to proof of stake. But uh, it's definitely, you know, we'll see where this one goes. With that, though, it's important to understand that there are two types of blockchains. And this is really where the enterprise conversation starts coming in. So those of you who are extremely familiar with cryptocurrencies are familiar with what we call public blockchains. These are completely permissionless. Uh, what that means is that anybody who wants to download a node can go and participate in these networks. That's awesome. It's great for enabling a bunch of different types of use cases, business cases, cryptocurrencies, whatever it is that you want to do on that, that's fantastic. But what we're seeing right now in the enterprise is that enterprises aren't quite as fond of just putting their information out there on a blockchain. So we have this concept of a private or permissioned blockchain where you can actually decide which participants get to participate in the overall network. Um, I will say that a lot of the uh, blockchain purists out there feel like this undermines one of the critical value propositions of blockchain, basically saying that, well, look, if you're going to specifically start prescribing who can access this, then maybe it's not so low trust that you really need a blockchain. But there are other benefits associated with using the technology other than just being able to decide who has access to it. So. Uh, you'll see a, a couple different uh, common brands. So in the public space, there's Ethereum and there's Bitcoin. In the private space, there's Hyperledger. There's Corda, which was started by a consortium called R3, which was a bunch of financial services companies banding together. And then uh, there's built on top of Ethereum, there's uh, four, three or four different private blockchain uh, instances that you can deploy, including Quorum, which was JP Morgan's that they, they've come out with recently, uh, built on top of Ethereum. So understand that there are two very key paradigms here, public versus private. It's kind of the, the same difference between internet versus intranet, right? So what are some of the celebrated business uh, benefits associated with implementing blockchain? Well, you'll hear about uh, efficiency, Auditability, transparency, and security. So as far as the efficiency goes, if you guys have ever been in an enterprise setting and you've seen all of these systems crammed together and you've seen all these manual processes set up just as workarounds to deal with the, the, the might of the dysfunction that emerges from cramming all of these systems together, it's a key value proposition that blockchain brings to the table. 
we can strip a lot of that stuff out because we're provided, providing a medium uh, for data to exchange a little bit more freely that we can potentially disintermediate some of those systems and cut out a lot of those processes so it's going to be greater efficiency. There's also perfect auditability and traceability, or pretty dang close to perfect auditability and traceability. Uh, you have the ability to look back at any block and understand exactly what happened at any point in time. So there's really no corrupting audit logs, there's no losing audit logs because Every single block has, like I said earlier, the entire previous chain encoded within it. There's transparency, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, you know, it allows people to understand, depending on your rollout of how your blockchain is uh, configured, it can allow people to see into the operations of whatever process that, that you're tracking, uh, and it allows them to audit it in a, a pretty easy manner, low-touch manner, um, that it can actually be a key selling proposition, key value proposition for a lot of businesses. Uh, they can go to their clients and say, look, you have concerns about our practices, you have our, uh, you know, concerns maybe about our sustainability. Well, all of our processes, all of our supply chain is tracked here on this blockchain and we're giving you guys access to it. So you have perfect transparency into how things are running. That way when I say as a business that I am a sustainable business, Maybe I don't have to rely on some sort of trusted third party to, uh, to give me the credential. Maybe my customers can actually go and see it for themselves. So pretty cool. Now the, uh, the, the dicey issue of security. So I'm not going to stand up here in front of you and tell you that blockchain is perfectly secure. If you look around the, uh, the blockchain industry, a lot of people like to uh, give blockchain the secure by design moniker, but you have to really understand what goes into a real deployment of blockchain. So. Blockchain is an application with some really, really good math. Uh, we're pretty confident in the really good math, right? The, the, the math is pretty sound, although it is not impervious. It's definitely still important to validate this really good math. But as with any other application, even if that math is super good and super secure, there's a whole other area, a, a potential area for attack, a whole other attack surface um, that is vulnerable to anybody who wants to do wrongdoing. So it's a full stack out there that you have to work on securing. And I'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a few minutes. So entering the internet of value. So a lot of people are sitting there shaking their heads going, okay, you've got some sort of cryptographic scheme to store data in a really, really complicated way. Like, why is this revolutionary? Why do I care? What does this really represent? And so this is where the concept of the internet of value really emerges. So I'll talk through this slide here. We like to say that we're in the fourth industrial revolution. So the first industrial revolution was awesome. We got steam engines. We can all of a sudden move really, really heavy things from place A to place B. That's fantastic. Second industrial revolution was the assembly line and the birthplace of standardization and mass production and allowed just unprecedented efficiency. That's fantastic. The third industrial revolution is all about uh, computing and internet. We're calling this the internet of information. So it's exchanging internet, uh, information among people on some sort of network. And never before had we seen such freely exchanged ideas and information that, that knowledge of humanity grew exponentially once this came out, right? It's, it's truly spectacular. Industry 4.0, or the Industrial Revolution, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, is all about immediacy, privacy, uh, and efficiency. And uh, so I'll, I'll start talking about that in a second, but I think to understand it, what you have to really understand is what is the internet of value. So in the internet of things, you can potentially duplicate things. I'm sure no one in this room was ever involved in such devious activities, but maybe there is something going on in the music industry in the last two or three decades with, with illegally reproducing and disseminating music, right? Well, all of a sudden now, what we've started to realize is there are these digital assets that are of value. And there's a really big problem in that they're not unique uh, or, or they, they can be easily duplicated. And so this is called uh, the digitization gambit. And it's kind of the slippery slope that is associated with sticking everything digital. When you make every single thing digital, how do you know that what you're dealing with is distinct? So we've got all of these things that we value here. We've got identity, we've got uh, art, we've got visual art, music, film, we've got your votes, you've got your intellectual property contracts, anything that you might want to prove is distinct. But on the internet of information, you could easily just copy and replicate and disseminate at your leisure. What blockchain does and why it's so monumental is it solves what cryptographers have been calling for a long time the double spend problem. The concept of it is 
I give you $5 of my fake internet money, how do you know that I'm not retaining a copy of that fake internet money? That sounds really simplistic, but that's actually a really big issue. And that's a, a difficult thing in a cryptographic manner or any other uh, programmatic manner to try and prevent and solve. And so we've seen already with the, the whole crypto boom how much value this can create in the cryptocurrency space. But think about, once, once again, as we go start talking about all of these other assets, think about how much other value, how many other distinct digital assets could create value if you could transfer them from peer to peer to peer and, and understand and trust that things haven't been duplicated. Maybe your car title, maybe the title to your house. All of these things are paper processes that you have to sign right now to prove the authenticity and the, the uniqueness of. But what if there was some sort of digital solution that allowed you to do this without ever having to put pen to paper or do it in mass? Pretty cool. All right. So this is really exciting. Everyone gets super excited, right? They, uh, they start dumping all of their money into blockchain, right? The, the cryptocurrencies are blowing up. Blockchain becomes like the, the, the biggest buzzword aside from IoT and augmented reality and uh, you know, machine learning and all of that. That's awesome. So the enterprise starts getting really, really excited. Fantastic. But then this happens. We were talking about this before a lot of you guys came into the room. But there's a known hype cycle for emerging technologies. Every new technology goes through this process where people get really, really excited about it and they dump their investment into it. And there's, there's a little bit of a bubble. And then, okay, maybe it isn't the end all be all. Maybe it isn't the silver bullet to all of our problems. Maybe you can't convince Chick-fil-A to stay open on Sundays with this new technology, right? This was, however, compounded in this instance with the popping of an asset bubble on top of it. So, we have the normal pain points that you would feel with the trough that follows the peak. And that's typically painful, right? Typically you see companies and startups running out of business, people saying, oh, it's over, the future's over, this, this was all a fad, right, whatever. This was compounded by the fact that you had all of these assets out there that were just completely being fabricated uh, on a whim. You know, we, we've got ICOs happening left and right, a lot of times based not really on any specific value, right? These are speculative assets that are just moving up and down and they were moving up as long as everyone was really into the technology, but the second people started to, to become a little bit more bearish, they crashed, and this just this completely uh, like pile drove the, uh, the, the rest of the industry. And so understand that the recession in interest is a combination of something that is very predictable in the hype cycle, compounded by something that is a little bit more unprecedented, and that this new technology was surrounded by an asset bubble. So since, man, driving this thing from a mouse is tough. Uh, so since that bust, people in industry have been watching blockchain and the development of the technology kind of like this. They, uh, they see that there's value in implementing the technology. We see this in enterprises right now. Like, oh, we've got an idea about this thing that we might be able to do. We could probably cut out some intermediaries. We might be able to make things more efficient. We've had this problem that's kind of been nagging us for a while. But Dang, like that whole cryptocurrency thing was ugly. So they're sitting there and they're watching the industry evolve, but they've been kind of slow to try and adopt and, and start to bring this into enterprise. And so now, a year and a half or so after you know a, a lot of the air was taken out of the balloon, uh, we're starting to see some of the interest really start to rebound in the enterprise. All right. So let's talk through enterprise needs. Blockchain solves every problem. No. Enterprises who want to implement blockchain have to understand that first, right? They have to reduce the scope as if they were implementing any other technology to understand exactly what problem it is that we're trying to solve. I, uh, I kind of hit on this earlier in my Arm Wavy product manager's speech with the triangle, but you have to understand who your customer is and you have to understand what those customers need before you start coming up with solutions. So when you start saying blockchain solves every problem, think again. Reduce the scope, slow down. Why do people care about blockchain in the enterprise? Well, here are five pretty good reasons that we've seen so far. Uh, we've seen interest popping up various places in the C-suite. Originally, we were seeing interest pop up in R&D shops. It was some, you know, some guy in an R&D shop would maybe get like a little bit of a budget, and he had a cool idea, and it was a pet project. We're starting to see that shift, though, as this becomes a little bit more of a conversation in the C-suite. 
so blockchain removes the need to trust a third party. I kind of beat that one to death earlier. But blockchain removes the need to wait for a third party. So I don't know if you guys have ever transferred money via ACH before, or if you've ever had to go through the credit card processing process where you have authorization and settlement. But it's extremely slow, and it's extremely slow because it's extremely dysfunctional how many different hands are in that pot. And you've got so many systems in there that everything's trying to flow through. Uh, what blockchain presents is a platform for that data to flow a little bit more seamlessly so that you don't end up having to sit around and wait for everybody else to get their job done. Blockchain removes the need to submit to a third party. Now, what does this mean? I don't know if you guys have ever found yourself in industries before that have been dominated by one really, really aggressive third party. A lot of times, these might be certification companies. And so I gave you the example earlier about um, companies that are producing products, let's say paper. Uh, they're producing their paper products, and everyone really cares that their paper is sustainable. Well, these companies are being held hostage right now by third parties that are charging them a fortune to stick the green seal of approval on the outside of their packaging. And so they end up having to comply with a bunch of different regulations or rules or processes that don't really apply to their exact niche or exactly what they're doing. It doesn't really prove that they're any more sustainable. Uh, and yet they're being held hostage that they, you know, they cannot sell into this market unless they get some sort of thumbs up saying that they're producing their paper in a sustainable manner. Well, what if, I said this earlier, what if all of a sudden now companies could put their entire supply chain uh, in a manner that was visible so that people who cared about sustainability could easily audit every single process that they're doing and trust that the product that they're buying is green without having to look for some specific logo on a, on a piece of packaging. Pretty cool. Uh, people believe it to be encrypted, mathematically sound, and immutable. It is more secure. That is true, but I added those caveats earlier, and those caveats are very important, and I'll, I'll hit on those again in a second. People also believe that it can protect from attack uh, and protect private information and prove the truth. So this kind of bridges uh, trustworthiness with digital assets. So we see so much stuff fabricated all over the internet today. This brings trust to what you see because you, you can audit its, uh, its origins. So I'd like to talk through a, a few of my favorite examples of uh, how blockchain is being implemented in enterprise settings. And uh, so this one, this first one that I'll talk through is actually something I, I got to witness almost firsthand uh, two weeks ago at the Blockchain Revolution Global Conference in Toronto. I thought it was really neat. So we had up there on a the stage sworn enemies. It was FedEx, UPS, and DHL sitting all there next to each other. And they were talking about how they've teamed up with uh, hundreds of other people in the transportation and logistics industry to try and solve a variety of problems that they've spotted. Uh, currently, and I didn't know this, I was not as familiar with the industry, I don't know if you know that systemically a lot of these guys rely on each other to move packages throughout their system. So if they're in, in the uh, business of delivering things, FedEx may actually have uh, UPS uh, take one of their packages from point B to C and then UPS might actually have DHL then take that package from C to D all then to be delivered back to a FedEx guy back to your door right it's a very commingled industry and uh, with that the data associated with tracking packages throughout that entire movement process is really really messy so that was just kind of a, a pain point that was a point of inefficiency up until a couple of years ago when someone was trying to launch a, some sort of terrorist plot where they were shipping bombs inside of printer cartridges. And uh, the Department of Defense came to them and said, you guys need to track down every single printer cartridge in your entire network. And they go, ooh, that's tough. We got a lot of different systems of record here that we're trying to track things down. And oh yeah, the stakes are really high because if you don't get to them soon enough, like these things are going to blow up, right? So that, that, prevented, uh, that, that presented a terrific burning platform for these guys to band together and say, well, look, this is probably not the first time this has happened. This certainly isn't going to be the last time this has happened. If we can't solve this problem among ourselves in a tidy manner, then the government's going to solve it for us, and they're going to implement some sort of crazy regulation. And I don't know if you guys have tried to, to, uh, to comply with regulations implemented by the government before, but they aren't always done with the level of expertise that a practitioner would hope they were, you know, the, the level of care that a practitioner would hope they, they put in to developing some of these regulations. So a lot of times they're very disruptive and they're very expensive to comply with. So this is an awesome example of sworn competitors 
caught up in a uh, what, what they're calling coopetition. It is an awesome word, and I think it's a great word to keep in mind as we look at other use cases for blockchain. The concept that, yes, we're competitors, yes, we all want to beat each other, but we also understand that there are some problems that we are incapable of solving alone. And if we can find a way and a medium for us to lay down our swords for a little while, and we can actually cooperate, we can actually really implement some amazing change. So, pretty cool use case. I was proud of them to see that. That was, uh, that was definitely a new one for me. Also had the amazing uh, luxury of speaking to the CEO of a company called Sweetbridge. This is a, a company based in Phoenix, Arizona. Uh, and these guys want to rethink the entire financial system. And this is a, a pretty audacious effort. Uh, and I really want to abstract this from cryptocurrency because this is not a cryptocurrency company. Basically what they've done is they've looked across all of these different companies in the world. You, know, you, guys, have, uh, you guys work for enterprises, you have your full finance teams, you have your, your full uh, accounting teams. If you've ever looked at their processes and their systems and everything that they do, there's an enormous amount of dysfunction in there. And uh, none of the systems really talk well to each other, largely because of a really big data governance and data normalization problem. So these systems were implemented to, to do one thing, but they really needed to talk to something else and do something else, and they don't quite do that very well. Um, so then you have all of these jobs created, all of these middlemen that have to just manually transpose data from one system to another, or manually interpret data from one system to another. Well, that gets even worse as companies begin to try and exchange value. So now all of a sudden we're transacting and I sell you a widget, right? And I, it sits on my books one way and it sits on your books a different way. And those ways may not line up depending on what systems they're run through and who was interpreting the accounting as it was all happening. Now this would be a really hard problem to solve though because there is a massive data normalization problem. So what these guys are trying to do is uh, solve the puzzle of data normalization in the financial service, or in the financial world not just in financial services, but specifically as it applies to enterprises in general. Anybody who wants to be able to make all their systems not only talk seamlessly, but also talk across company lines to other company systems as well. Kind of a, a great ERP in the sky, if you will. So it's a pretty audacious goal. It's, uh, it's been really impressive, the work that they've been doing. They, uh, unlike a lot of the blockchain companies, they've been working most closely with lawyers and accountants, which is pretty crazy because almost everybody else is developing their stuff with either really good marketing guys or actual developers, hopefully. Um, so was was definitely uh, impressed with the conversation that we had with uh, Scott Nelson of Sweetbridge. Uh, three more examples that I'll run through pretty quickly here. If I can get the slide to change. First, in healthcare, so MIT Media Labs has created uh, an, an, an inter interoperability, interoperable, sorry, that's a tough word to say, an interoperable blockchain that tracks uh, patient medical data. So it allows you to go from one doctor to another uh, and easily and seamlessly bring with you all of your medical records so that they don't have this whole thing where you show up in the ER and they go, I don't know, you know, what pills does he take? I don't know, what medical conditions does he take? I don't know. This is a really big problem right now and it's inhibiting people's ability to receive quality medical treatment quickly, especially when time counts. And so uh, it's pretty cool work that MIT Media Lab has been doing to implement this, uh, this blockchain to track people's medical history for them in a, uh, a private manner. Supply chain. So this is one that uh, we heard about quite a bit in Toronto two weeks ago. So Walmart has uh, teamed up with Tsinghua University in China to bring credibility back to food supply chains. So there's this really big problem, especially in China right now, where the product you think you're buying isn't necessarily the product you are buying. And uh, sometimes that's just kind of funny and whimsical and inefficient and oh darn, maybe I got ripped off a few bucks. Sometimes though, it's, it's life-threatening. And so there are some legitimate medical risks that can come out of eating counterfeited foods or maybe foods that weren't transported in a safe and secure manner. Um, cold chain is a really good example of this. And cold chain sounds like a blockchain thing because it has the word chain in it, but it's not. It's actually a, it's a transportation logistics thing. You guys heard of cold chain transportation before? No, so cold chain transportation is actually a really simple concept. It's basically just the premise that food needs to be transported from point A to B to C to D to E at a certain temperature. It is literally a cold supply chain. Very simple concept, but what we have here is kind of a complex web of 10, 15, 20, 30 different participants that all have to be trusted to actually transport that food from point A to B to C to D to E, hand it off to each other on time before the expiration date, and oh, they also have to keep it cold the whole time. 
Well, so all of these guys are separate companies. They're uh, low trust or you know medium trust third parties, and they're actually incentivized to cheat because it's actually very expensive to keep something refrigerated for that long a period of time, especially if you're hauling it across the desert or whatever. And so this is a terrific example of how blockchain can bring trust to the situation. How we can actually track the temperature that, that food was stored throughout the entire uh, supply chain end to end and validate that the food that was being transported was the food that we intended to transport in the first place. So uh, pretty cool. Uh, a lot of great work being done by IBM and Walmart and Singwa University and Food Trust. And I definitely, yeah, go ahead. I'd just would like to understand the, the math behind that if that's possible. So if I'm in a truck driving across the desert for, mm -hmm. let's say, a day, and I'm the only one adding to the chain, I would assume. Mm -hmm. Or I guess other people are adding to the chain at the same time. Right, so you might be broadcasting your sensor data out there. Right, exactly. Gotcha. So what, what you're creating there is effectively a consortium. So um, kind of like how we say Bitcoin, everyone in here can be a Bitcoin node, right? And everyone in here can validate each other's transactions. What we're talking about here in the supply, supply chain use case is a little bit more of a consortium application. So we've got maybe 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 trusted nodes on here. We know who these companies are, and they're all going to take turns validating the data through yeah. some sort of consensus. I was thinking like the chain was about a piece of food being delivered. Right, yeah. That's the whole thing, yeah. Uh, okay, so then finally, insurance. And this is a really cool use case because this is actually something that you guys can mess with today if you would like. So there's a company called AXA out there. Uh, and this was pretty neat. I actually just learned about this one not too long ago. They've released a, an insurance, a travel insurance product called Fizzy. It's really neat. So if you guys have ever traveled before, which I'm sure all of you guys have, then you've probably had the inconvenience of being delayed or having your bags lost or any of those things. It's just a, a fact of life when you travel for work. Um, a lot of the airlines will either offer to sell you travel insurance to you know, recoup your losses should you incur any, uh, you know, if you have to go to lunch for an extra 30 minutes because your flight was delayed. Uh, a lot of times though it's kind of difficult, it's, it's a pain in the butt to collect those losses after it's actually happened and a lot of times they still ask that you submit proof that you actually incurred those losses which is kind of another thing. So you end up having to put paperwork together as though you're filing some sort of larger insurance claim and so this, this convenience that you're getting is really not that convenient altogether. So uh, through the creative use of smart contracts, AXA's product Fizzy is pretty cool. It allows you to go in and purchase insurance for a flight. All that flight information is out there uh, publicly accessible and they've got a smart contract sitting out there and that smart contract is tracking your flight and if your flight becomes more than two hours delayed it immediately triggers the smart contract and sends you the money. It's factual, right? Your flight was factually delayed and so what you're insuring against is the losses that could that you could incur in the event that your flight was delayed by more than two hours. So it removes all of these processes of you having to go and file and prove and all this stuff, and it's instantaneous. There's no phone calls. There's no following up with anybody. You just get the money. Pretty cool concept. So how do you implement blockchain in an enterprise? Well, it's a messy process, and unfortunately that's because a lot of enterprises' uh, project plans kind of look like this. So uh, it, there are some really important fundamentals to focus on, and, and we were actually talking about this earlier, uh, that you're a, a secure developer, right? You guys are security practitioners. You understand the value in building things secure from the ground up. Blockchain is no different. It's really, really important to focus on the fundamentals, and it's actually really difficult to do with blockchain, and here's why. A lot of times this is a controversial project that you're going to put into a company, maybe you've only got limited support, you've got limited funding, and so you as a person implementing this project are under a lot of pressure to show value really quickly. A lot of corners are cut. A lot of people are doing whatever it is that they could possibly do to get their product up and running, get their prototype going, and then, oh, the prototype's built, let's just throw some production data in there, right? Not good practices. And so uh, what I would challenge you guys to do is be the voice of reason in your companies as, uh, it, which is not always easy to do, uh, depending on the, the nature of the company. But as blockchain starts creeping in, and as you start seeing these use cases be developed, try and ground the people and say, look, there can be some merit to your idea. I'm not saying anything otherwise, but do not forget the fundamentals, right? We're only as weak as our weakest point here. A lot of it comes down to basic secrets management. And I don't mean to belittle secrets management by calling it basic because I understand that it is an entire field of, uh, uh, of study to which many people have devoted their entire lives. But just like you'd manage secrets anywhere else in your organization, 
your blockchain is only as secure as its secrets, and if you're relying on secret keys for people to be able to unlock uh, functionality associated with the blockchain, then your blockchain is only as secure as those people's ability to keep their secret key secret, just like anything else that you'd see in your enterprise. So what does it look like to stop the bad guys? This might look familiar to you guys, uh, because this is pretty much what it takes to stop the bad guys everywhere else as well. Uh, we're seeing that the same processes associated with securing a blockchain application uh, are the same that it would take to secure any other full stack application within an organization. So you've got to have a code review. Uh, we do, you know, we add a crypto and math analysis in there as well. We think that that's really important. Um, we've seen some instances of people being able to pay themselves infinitely and crazy things like that. So, yeah, have, have the math looked at by a math guy. Uh, basic pen testing. Audit coverage, uh, you know, inspect the full stack architectures, make sure that it is really designed with security in mind. Uh, and then build on existing tech. Uh, so just because this is a new and innovative technology doesn't mean the whole thing has to be built with new and innovative technologies. You know, you're taking a big risk by implementing something like this, perhaps. Why take such a big risk by implementing every single thing else that's unproven? So you guys have certain technologies that you, you can trust, that you can rely on, that you know how to implement well. Keep that in mind as you're building out your architectures. All right, the final couple thoughts. What is next for blockchain? So these are a couple crazy uh, headlines that we've seen so far. Uh, most of them are associated with the legal problems with blockchain here in the United States, but it really is global. So I don't know if you guys realize this right now, but the uh, securitization of physical assets is largely illegal in the United States. And so when we start talking about a platform that allows you to tokenize assets and trade them and loan them and, and borrow against them and all sorts of stuff like that, it's actually illegal in a lot of places. And it's a, it's a pretty big issue that can be destabilizing for a lot of companies that are trying to build in this space. So right now there are, I think it's 13 states in the US that have created what we've called blockchain sandboxes. And basically they say up to a certain dollar amount and we're going to allow you to do this stuff that would be illegal otherwise as far as tokenizing assets and loaning against them and all, all sorts of stuff like that. Um, we will, you know, we're not going to turn a blind eye, but we're going to allow you to prove its business model while we start to understand the technology and we can legislate uh, a little bit more accordingly. So that's actually a very sensible approach. Um, it's, it's a new field. I know that uh, there's some awesome blockchain sandboxes out there, both within the United States and outside the, the United States. Uh, Phoenix, uh, Arizona is a hot spot for that. Outside of the United States, the Isle of Man is uh, trying to become Crypto Island, which is pretty cool. So uh, they're they're working on you know bringing all the cryptocurrency and all the the, uh, the blockchain companies out there to try and improve their concepts. So everyone is really in this uh, the space race to try and be the place where it all happens. But they're also not just completely opening up the books to let it all happen immediately. So that's what's happening in these sandboxes. What's the legal issue with the securitization? It's called. Yeah. So yeah. So you're not always able to just secure physical assets because uh, securities are, are pretty heavily regulated, right? There's a, there are a lot of things that you can abuse consumers and uh, you know, like monetary bases, you know, like. Securitization, loaning, and borrowing can be a pretty destabilizing force, and there's a lot of opportunity for abuse within. And so there are a whole lot of rules associated with that, uh, and what these, you know, what these governments are doing is saying, look, you, know, you can loan up to $250,000, and we're not going to say a thing, right? It's okay for you guys to loan up to $250,000. Now, you guys aren't going to become billionaires by loaning $250,000, but you're going to prove that you're a viable business. Maybe you can go get your venture capital funding. And while you're doing all that, we're going to see that you're not abusing people. Uh, you know, you're not taking advantage of people who aren't as edu educated about the technology or about the math, um, and that it's ultimately secure that this isn't going to collapse in some sort of dreadful uh, you know, security incident. Where, where could I go to look up what's the rules for you know, Georgia and the surrounding states? That's a terrific question. Uh, you know, a, a lot of our uh, research has been pretty fragmented in that we haven't really found uh, a cohesive system of record where we can go in and just see the, the, the current laws of you know, the blockchain industry everywhere you go. Um, but one of our offerings, and I, you know, I'm not here to talk about our offerings, but one of our offerings uh, is, is to help people roll out their idea into a sandbox. And so a lot of that does tie in the legal component of it, and uh, legal, technical, and security. Um, you know, we, we expect them to own the business viability of it, but it's a, a, it's a tangled web right now, and it's constantly evolving. So even by the time you get it documented, it seems to have changed. Uh, so it's, it's, uh, unfortunately, that's the best answer I can give you.
All right. Uh, I, I can add to that. Yeah, please do. There, there's a big blockchain organization in Atlanta. If you go on Meetup, you can find them. Um, I can show it to you afterwards. Um, I'm on it. I've been to a couple of their meetings. And, and that would be the place to go in and find the contacts and, and the people to talk to about that. Yeah. I think they've had a couple of meetings discussing that those topic. Totally, and it's actually um, one of the coolest things about blockchain is the blockchain community. And you know, there are some amazing meetups around. Uh, you know, you get a lot of really passionate people in one direction or another. It's pretty fragmented right now across different technologies. But the communities end up being pretty supportive of the concept in general. They want it to succeed. They've just got very different, passionate ideas of how the success will be executed. Um, but it's it's definitely been really neat to see. I've gotten to go to some some meetups around. Um, speak to some folks at different conferences, and uh, it is a supportive community, like you said. That's awesome. So the future of blockchain, where is the industry headed? Uh, there are kind of three things that I've seen so far. One is standardization. So enterprises don't want to be the ones to implement a technology that ends up being replaced by a different technology. They don't know which horse to bet on. And so we've heard this uh, from a lot of C-level executives so far. In the enterprise, they say, look, we think that your ideas have merit. We think that they can solve some of our problems, but I'm also not going to give you a million dollars because I don't know if your technology is going to be around in six months. Totally legitimate problem. And so what the industry is airing towards is standardization. And a lot of the, uh, the blockchain platforms right now are teaming up uh, in a, a, an awesome display of competition to try and standardize a token format so that tokens can easily be transferred uh, across platforms and that might one day ease uh, the overall standardization burden associated with rolling out a new technology. But we see this with every technology, right? There's always uh, a foot race to try to be the one who wins out. Um, it's a messy process, but someone always ends up winning. And uh, you know, it still hasn't happened yet, but, but we're getting closer. Scalability. So I mentioned the energy consumption issue earlier on the 14.7 days of electricity that it takes to process every transaction, that obviously has to be fixed. And so a lot of the blockchain platforms are implementing what they're calling level two solutions. Uh, it's, it's the idea of it is, can we take some of these transactions off chain and still provide a degree of trust? And so uh, to, to just give you a brief understanding of how like one of those works, so Bitcoin Lightning, for example, says, okay, well, there might be instances where two people are really transacting with each other pretty frequently. There, there isn't this lack of trust around um, completely. So let's say uh, Izzy and I are, are going to transact maybe 10 or 15 times over the next couple of days. What we're going to do is we're going to write and sign each other transactions. It would be like if I was writing her a check and she would write me a check back and I'd write her a check. And we never took them to the bank, but we were just writing each other checks. So we would fund this escrow account this smart contract, we would write each other these checks, and then when we decided, okay, our business relationship is terminated, then we would settle it, and that would be the ending balance that would actually get recorded on the blockchain. So an interesting concept, what that allows is for us to take a lot of the transactions off, train, off chain, but still have trust in them. It also brings a certain degree of privacy to the transacting, because that way, you don't know how many times Izzy and I uh, transacted or what the exact dollar amounts were. You just saw the ending balance, which can be some, some desirable privacy for folks. Um, so that, it's a pretty cool concept. Definitely still not proven. They're, they're in the development stage right now. Uh, who knows if it'll succeed or fail. I know Ethereum's got their own concept of it. I think it's called Plasma. Uh, you, you might know Ethereum Plasma. OK, yeah, pretty sure it's called Plasma. Either way, though, there's this whole conversation of second layer solutions um, to try and make the network more scalable. And then finally, and this is Vitalik Buterin's grand scheme, his grand picture is interoperability. He's the interoperability guy. Uh, Vitalik Buterin was the 19-year-old that invented Ethereum. And he's now, I think he's 24, 25, pretty amazing guy, absolutely brilliant. Uh, and his whole vision is a series of blockchains connected to each other. And what that means is that you have to be able to do something like standardize a token so that if, I, you know, if Izzy and I are transacting on one chain and then I want to go over here and I have this ending balance and I, I want to transact with her on a different chain, I have to have the ability to do that and that requires a certain degree of standardization. Uh, so that's, those are kind of the three places where people seem to think that the industry is going. Uh, and we'll just kind of see over the next year or two as these really unfold because some of these technologies will, will succeed, some of them uh, won't. 
So I'll start to wrap up here. I realize that I've got about five minutes. Uh, so transformational potential is amazing uh, for this technology. It is not a silver bullet. Some barriers definitely need to be overcome before this is really going to uh, be able to realize its full potential. I mentioned the scalability, I mentioned the regulatory hurdles. Uh, the immutability or the security component is definitely going to become a bigger and bigger talking point as, this, as the technology matures. Um, overall, this is restating the points from the beginning, blockchain will not solve all of your problems, but it does some things very, very well. Uh, it has the potential to disrupt a lot of different industries, and as security practitioners, you guys need to be prepared to advise your businesses accordingly and, and be that voice of reason to say, look, there is some merit to what you want to do here, but do not forget the fundamentals. Here were some of the value propositions that we talked about, and you know, the, the, a key one being that it can help uh, prove the truth. It's this really important concept right now. So I'll go back to this quote that I opened with. You guys caught me. All right, uh, he didn't say this, uh, but you know, busted, shoot. It's not always this easy, though. Uh, think about everything that you guys have seen in the press. All you know, this, this has become a hot button issue right now, the whole concept of fake news. Uh, it is becoming more and more difficult for people to understand uh, fiction from reality. And it's, it's, like a, it's almost a battle of good versus evil, in a sense, because uh, it's a very difficult issue right now, especially as we're stuck in the paradigm of the Internet of Information where things can be so easily fabricated and disseminated <coughs> without validation. But what blockchain really does is help resolve this chasm that exists between truth and trust. Uh, and like I said, it's probably not a silver bullet. There are a lot of other things that have to happen before we can stop the spread of fake news or before we can solve all the other world's problems. But the way I see it, this is a fantastic tool that, that puts us one step in the right direction. So guys, thank you very much for your, your time and your patience. I definitely appreciate it. I hope you guys have a fantastic conference and a great rest of your weekend.